Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Messy Time Studios. Another uneventful day in world history. There's nothing happening anywhere around the world, so we thought we'd take a break and <laughs> check in with our friend and colleague, Darcy Raming, who is the founder, chairman, and CEO of Arawak X, uh, a revolutionary, and I use that term advisedly, a uh, great new exchange in, in the Caribbean. Uh, I will stop short of, of praising him more. We'll get into that in the discussion. You know, Darcy, thanks so much for coming on the show. It's great to be here. Excellent. Absolutely Excellent. great. So for the, my listeners who don't yet know about Arawak X, maybe you could give a little background. Uh, you know, a lot of folks who did not bother to study linguistics and anthropology don't even know what Arawak means. I do, but let's, let's hear from you. So uh, you tell us a bit about you know, your background and how you came to found Arawak X and what the, what the goals are. Sure. So first of all, um, I got my taste with electronic exchanges with the Globex, um, which was a, a collaboration between Reuters, the Mercantile Exchange, the Border Trade, and the Matif. Mm -hmm. And this was back in the 90s when um, they wanted to make trading electronic. Of course, there was a lot of resistance about it. They thought that the floor would never change. Um, and there was, there was no way that a computer could somehow replace the floor, but they began to see that there was a business opportunity dealing with the um, after hours trading. And so Reuters transaction system, Reuters is known for its news agency, of course, at that time, and um, uh, less so for its transaction systems, but they did do a deep dive into that. Yeah. They created a, uh, an electronic trading system to catch that after hours trading. And, and I had the fortune to be um, look at this for about five years where I was involved in from the development and testing to the, to the actual implementation and then even the technical operations. I ended up being the technical operations manager at the Globex Control Center, hmm. which gave me a good taste of... of of electronic exchanges and how they were different. And so while at the Merck, I made a lot of great friends um, like Fred Arditi. Oh, yeah. Who, um, yeah, Fred was a great guy. Um, mm -hmm. I used to teach him jujitsu for an hour and he would teach me futures and options for an hour and we would share <laughs> meals again. Which, which ended up being more useful. <laughs> <laughs> That's still debatable, right? <laughs> and jujitsu is arguably more important in floor trading, that in like yeah, yeah. some irony there, but that's that's fascinating. I didn't know that about about the uh, yeah. combat lessons. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, so um, it was a it was a great experience. And after Chicago, I I came back to my native land, uh, which is the Bahamas, and I uh, was snow. the first. Yeah, less snow. That was fifth. I had spent fifteen winters in Chicago. You know, I was at uh, Northwestern University. Right. Um, first as a student and uh, engineering and MBA, and then finally went on to work there for a few years before finally bringing my family back home. Right. And I was the chief operating officer of the first uh, exchange uh, the, in the Bahamas, but it's called BISEX, the Bahamas International Securities Exchange. Right. But, um, uh, you know, my ideas for markets and capitalism come from America. So I'm an uh, American style uh, financial markets capitalist type guy. So you're and the I, one that took the conviction away from America that we should have been <laughs> capitalist. You took it to the Bahamas because <laughs> it seems to be lacking these days. Here. <laughs> well, the, spirit, the spirit of it won't die. It, no, the markets no. will always come. Back. Unwilling. <laughs> yes. Yes. Uh, but uh, so that differed a little with the um, sort of the, let's say, the English approach to capital markets that we wanted to adopt. Right. And so I um, went into the wilderness, as some people would say, but 20 years into management consulting, which was good because I got to consult with um, everyone from these very small firms. I mean, I'm talking like the Rastafarian on the street corner selling peanuts right. to, to some international firms doing business in the Bahamas. And um, I got a really wide experience of a lot of different business type models, which some of it I didn't think was useful at the time. But now 
uh, when we spun back into um, when I spun back into financial markets and helped develop the Arawak X exchange, um, we see the value of it because, and I'll get into it later. One of the challenges with the Caribbean is how to develop companies that are investable, right? And moving them from a mom and pop to something that somebody else could could possibly be interested in. But Arawak, the name Arawak comes from the native um, Indians that were here. The, there were different types of Indians in the islands, uh, Caribs, Arawaks, and um, the trading language of, the, of all of these people, though, when they actually, they did have some trade between them, um, was the Arawak language. Right. So we decided to name it the Arawak Exchange, given a nod to our Caribbean roots. That's awesome. And part, and part of, for, for our listeners who don't pay a lot of attention or just haven't thought about it, part of that reason of that difficulty of uh, sizing up a business or growing it has, has a lot to do with, with physical geography, right? Yes. Um, we are an archipelago of islands. And the old Caribbean is like a, just one small groupings of populations spread over a, a vast territory of islands. Right. Which, of course, means that when fintech came about, it's perfect because it has the ability to unite these communities. Um, we also have the distinction of geographically being located right next to the largest market in the world, the United States of America, and having um, the power of an English law system which is really great for writing contracts and business. And so um, we have that uh, energy and our own independence so that we can create our own licensing and regulations. And so what we are trying to do is be a gateway, a financial gateway between the United States of America and the Caribbean people, possibly Latin America, and even the Commonwealth right. to be a gateway because we have a lot in common with our, with our partners there. That, um, and they all need the U.S. dollar. <laughs> so far, let's hope that remains true. I wanted to circle back in something pr pretty quickly, which would be, I think, illustrative for, for a lot of listeners who don't spend a lot of time on what we, you know, kind of market geeks call market structure, right? So you alluded to the differences between American style capitalism and more uh, English or British style capitalism. How would you characterize the main difference between those? I think that the main difference is in the psychology of the people. Hmm. For example, you would see that about, I think the numbers between 55 and 65% of Americans own stocks. Hmm. Do you know what the number is in England? It's like I, like eleven percent. Right. That's funny. It's about to say eight percent. That's, that's yeah. Impressive. So <laughs> so their attitude towards uh, business and uh, uh, your wealth being in your business is different from an American's. It's a, it's not it's nothing. It's built on the psychology of how they approach business. In my opinion. Now, there yeah. might be some difference in thinking. We're, they're more Keynesian and, and big government and yeah. should be involved, whereas Americans are more, oh, no, 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 no. I don't want the government involved. I want to right. mar let the market speak. Hi, I'm for the government. I'm here to help you. They want to <laughs> yeah. we, we, so, <laughs> somehow we don't believe that. And, you know, one of, one of my... Uh, one of the guys that is on our advisory board now that is our chief economic advisor was my professor at uh, university at Northwestern. And right. I remember something that he told me that really uh, helped to develop um, my thinking towards it and the type of American style capitalist that I am. He told me, if you rely on the government, you're going to eat dog food when you're old. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> so, <laughs> this, is, this, was, this was Professor Kazarian's That's statement to a very impressionable young man. It's very wise. I would also take a moment to highlight here, just as a, a bit of a shout out for, for, for Messy Times itself, that Messy Times embodies tolerance for difference. The fact that a University of Chicago graduate can speak politely <laughs> with a Northwestern alumnus right, is, yeah. is, is groundbreaking stuff. 
By, <laughs> by the way, Professor Kazarian is a PhD from guess which school? <laughs> the right. University of Chicago. <laughs> what made him think that he should drive up Lakeshore Drive, go past it, go get to Evanston and teach there? I, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> Clearly, don't know. he has, has his motivation. But anyway, we're not going to touch on that. Yeah. <laughs> it's delightful <laughs> to me. But I, another Northwestern uh, alumnus I dealt with was hilarious. We were working on a very big transaction years ago. And uh, and it was a big term sheet, a lot of money involved, and he was allocating the capital. And, and in the final meeting, he said, I've just got one little codicil I'd like to add to the deal documents. And of course, the lawyers are looking at him and the investment bankers are freaking out. And I'm laughing because they know what it's going to be. He's like, I want Mr. Messina to stand up and say that Northwestern is a better school. <laughs> <laughs> to which I replied, we know what I am. I'm just talking price. Where do you want me to stand? <laughs> Where you always stand, yeah. <laughs> anyway, so yeah, so you so so uh, you 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 created that. You looked at a better model. You've got experience in in seeing lots of different kinds of companies. How they're going to try to scale. You know how exchanges work. Having run Globex and having been a user, I got to say you read it smoothly. Um, so the idea for RWX was let's create this exchange. And and the things that changed in the interim from the open outcry era was internet connectivity fintech tools that enable people trade. Maybe you could expand on that a little bit so people really understand that this yeah. is a really different way of building an exchange and getting capital into markets that need it. Yeah, for example, the Reuters network, their, their value add was it was a private network. And so they had a huge data center in Hopog. They had all these continents. It cost $100 million to build. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Whereas this particular exchange, the Arawak X exchange, we probably have spent about two and a half to three million in um, in uh, capital, which is still, you know, some money, but but it's but it's not a hundred million. Right. And, and things come down in scale. We were talking about that uh, earlier, right? That when we built BrokerTech back in ninety nine. I think the, the contract with um, the technology provider in, in the Nordic countries, I think it was sort of like 11 or $15 million a year for CapEx. And then yes. the equivalent amount for OpEx. Like today, building a, a, a limit order book trading exchange is like a computer science seminar project in college. Yes. Right? Yes. It's, it's so things right. change and become cheaper to do and better. Yeah, it's cheaper, more efficient, and it's cloud-based. So when you visit our campuses... Uh, you would see that we're in our offices and we have these portable PCs. And well, how can you guys be a fintech company? Where's the rest? Where's the rest of right. your company? I had one director that was very difficult because he is a great guy, but he's from the kind of '80s era of computing, and he's wondering where's the data center. Right. Uh, of mm-hmm. course, and these guys that has his secretary print that as emails for him to reply. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Love them. He just complained to me about um, having to two finger type. You know, it's like okay, <laughs> all sense. right. But you have to you have to be able to translate to them because they have the money. So, <laughs> oh, absolutely, and that, and that transition is part of what is is so empowering, right? Those people who embrace change, which he clearly does, right? And God God bless him for stepping outside of his comfort zone for being a director of something that he doesn't fully understand. I think that's brilliant. Yes, yes. Well, the business principles don't change, right? But the way they're delivered and how they're delivered and, and, the, and the things necessary. So I would say that that is the primary difference. The fintech is cloud-based. It's um, open architecture, meaning that you can bring different parts into it, uh, APIs or, or different, different vendors can get together. Why, you can white label a lot of stuff and, and bring them together, as opposed to having to have a development team, which could take however long. Yep. It's in real time, so um, the um, idea of of batch settlements and stuff like that. No, it's happening. You know, no T plus three. You can actually do delivery versus payment. Um, all of these things are, are are possible, and then it's mobile. You can access it on your on your cell phone um, over over the internet, and and finally, it's scalable. So. I don't need to build um, this huge capacity um, before um, before my business can support it. 
And uh, so that is that is what the crux of uh, the technology side of the modern. But the business principles really are are the same. You need to have a company that has a good team. If you don't have a good team, if you're not credible, no one's investing in you. It can't just be you because if something happens to you, people want to know that their, right. their money doesn't die it's with nice. you. <laughs> right. Oh, exactly. The incorporation. That's uh, one of the most brilliant uh, innovations ever in capital markets, right? Creating a separate body. Exactly. Corporation uh, has changed the world for the better. And those countries that never adopted that, that still remained on kind of family or tribal based trust relationships, they remain stymied because the heart of yes. capitalism is that you have a set of structures where you can trust complete strangers. And, and you know, believe it or not, even in the, in, even in the Caribbean, it, even though they have the capital structure, the spirit behind it is still sort of tribal in a lot of ways. And now this um, type of exchange gives the ability for you to be partners with somebody from halfway across the world that you don't really know, but you just share a business interest with. Right. Um, we were talking earlier about um, security and 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 uh, I'm, I'm I'm putting your information or people being comfortable with putting their information on the net. Well, you're you're old enough to remember when it was like a big deal if somebody put a credit card on the net. Oh, madness! madness. <laughs> yeah. it's a little bit insane, but yeah. <laughs> oh, I think the, the thing that that just to, to kind of highlight for folks, for Americans, is very hard to understand because it's a country of, you know, 350 million people. And if you even if you live in a small town in Iowa, if I'm going to pick on Iowa for right now, lovely place. Um, but you understand that if your town is 400 people, you have to drive to the next nearest larger population center for there to be a physical bank. There's no that the cost to infrastructure of running a traditional financial system. Uh, I think Americans predominantly, especially Americans in bigger urban centers, never really think about. It, right, you, you can walk into right. a bank, you can get stuff done, and if you have enough money in your checking account, they don't charge you for having the checking account, at least you know explicitly. Yes, so don't stop to think that real estate, people, electricity, it's all costs. Whereas yes. you've got a thousand islands. Some of them with eight people on them, others with 200 people on them. Right. You never develop the critical mass. And only NASA, for example, is it big enough for you to bother to put a bank in. Right. You solve that problem because you allow people to transact incredibly disparately without having to have a physical. Exactly. And, and in another way that that problem is solved is the whole legacy idea. We can actually jump across that because we don't have to um, reinvent the wheel or bring legacy systems up. One of the, you mentioned banking. Um, one of the most challenging things in dealing with US investors is to understand that here it could take three to six months to open a bank account. Right. <laughs> uh, um, you know, why? Well, we are very process oriented. So, if somebody put down in 1980 that this is what you do before you open a bank account, chances are there are some people that are following that to the letter. Right. And those people that have been promoted are the ones that were able to follow that to the letter. So they don't have <laughs> right. concern <laughs> with efficiency because they don't have the competition until recently. Right. Um, that is that companies like Arawak X are, are bringing to the market. It's It's a major disruption. So you've been you've been operationally live since August of 2021. What are the biggest highlights that have gone well? What are the things you learned that you're improving on? Like wh where do you guys sit in terms of analyzing your development to date and how did it track the plan and all, all that kind of stuff? Yeah, well, some of the big highlights is that there's a lot of interest. So within the first um, 90 days, we had signed up about 6,000 people, which is, which is about 3% of the working population of the country, nice. which is, you know, 6,000 people doesn't sound like a lot of people, but in the Bahamas. 3% <laughs> sure. of a market is huge. It's, it's a lot of people percentage-wise. Then the, the other element, uh, yes, and then the other element is we did have our first successful launch where we raised about $1.8 million for a company, 
um, the Red Lobster franchise up here. Right. Um, proving the technology in the model, um, it was not done without a lot of bumps in terms of uh, our initial onboarding process because you had to take people that were used to, were not used to two, 300 people onboarding on, in a day. They were used to two or three people onboarding in a month. Right. And so we had to create very disruptive processes in that regard. And so this, these are these were the positives. But what we what we did realize is that the reason that company funded was because we had a big lead investor come in. And then once the crowd saw that it was over its minimum uh, level of funding, everybody started to rush in and started to um, sure. want to be a part of it. Whereas we had launched two other companies that did not have the big investors, and these were fantastic companies, I think. One had to do with a, um, really, this guy was ahead of the metaverse, hmm. and he had, uh, he had seen augment, augmented tourism reality company. Fantastic idea, fantastic product. The other person, um, it was a team of ladies that had um, put together a FDA certified lab. So when things are created in the Caribbean, in the Bahamas, they can export to the United States and they would be FDA certified. So there's no challenge with customs holding them up or, right. or uh, <laughs> these type of things. But they did not fund. They did not reach their funding goals. Huh. So we pivoted. Right. And what we did was we decided to create a private deal room where we would syndicate um, high-end investors, high net worth investors, as well as uh, um, institutional investors and funds to um, come in and get the first 30 to 50% before we offer it to the crowd. And that's the process that we're going through right now. Um, we have managed to sign on a, a uh, Caribbean fund and they're looking to come in in the next within the next uh, 60 days um, and they're going to um, have about 10 million dollars specifically dedicated towards companies in that private deal room oh that, that's brilliant that, because that creates the engine for yes yes for sponsoring and do you have a lot of a, a lot of markets are driven by broker participation and stuff like that do you have a similar concept where you've got members who are able to trade at advantageous rates or something that 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 makes them want to bring more deal flow or is that kind of a next yes so what what yeah what we're what that's what we're in the process of developing right now of saying hey we're open for business and this is the type of business we're open for um we want to develop a relationship with funds and broker dealers and whatnot um one of the advantages that we have um, by nearshoring companies here, uh, you know, we're thought of as an offshore center. Right. And sometimes people with an offshore center view it as somewhere to hide money, to put a nameplate up and then just let money pass through using your country as a sort of a, just a conduit to pass money through high taxes, these type of things. Well, of course, the rest of the world, um, is not happy with a lot of these offshore centers because they figure they're um, hiding um, monies and taxes that are due to them. And that has led to country- a very much overblown problem and exists far more in the popular imagination than it does in reality. Well, you know, if you can wipe out competition- <laughs> by... <laughs> that's, a, that's an important point for people to think about, right? That yes. you know, one of the first things I learned on Wall Street was that, that concept of talking your book, right? Yes. And so do, do, do current dominant financial centers, New York, London, Frankfurt, right? Hong Kong and the like, who, who benefits from spreading this constant story that, yes. that, that you know, the, the Caymans and Bahamas and BVI and, and the rest are somehow doing something wrong? They never come right out and say it's illegal because that's factually incorrect, right? So, but they right. can spread this, doubt and it's to yes. their interest. The people should really think about that hard because there's always a home country bias in investing we empirically see that constantly right people yes. invest in their home country just because it sounds familiar whereas equally empirically the best opportunities are always in newer markets 
getting in early. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the things that other people haven't discovered yet. So this is a frontier market. Um, and also what we've decided to take the approach of is not only can we help companies in this market, but we can also help companies in the American markets. Sure. Because, of course, there are a lot of people, I think the number is about 60,000 startups that do not get funded because they themselves are not able to get to that 30%. You know, you have, uh, um, if you look at the record of who gets funded in the venture capitalist community, it's largely white, male, Ivy League school, uh, or, you know, um, but um, of course their innovation exists across all communities. Yeah. So that means that some people are, are not being funded because they can't access that type of capital. And so what we are trying to do is we're trying to build a wall of cash through funds that will look objectively at these companies, look at them to see if they have a good innovative idea, if they have um, a market that's accessible to them. And, and it could be that the company is coming from the United States, but near short in the Bahamas, uh, giving that opportunity. So we view ourselves as an international company operating out of the Bahamas. And you have a brilliant pitch because the one thing that was missing from your very accurate description of the population that normally gets venture funding is they top at it about age 28, right? The number of times that I, and that's deliberate, right? The Silicon Valley VCs, their business model depends upon, I'm going to give this kid a bunch of money like they, they they came up with the exploding term sheet. Like, hi, here's an insane valuation, and sign this. <laughs> term sheet. You've got sixty minutes. Go right. Uh, and, and what? And I constantly deal with with successful people of a range of different uh, demographics, but all of whom were like over forty. And my first word of advice is, don't go to the valley. They're going to steal your intellectual property. They're not going to invest in you because the, the worst thing they the, what they don't want is a founder who's got experience and knows that the term sheet they're being offered is terrible, right? Yeah. So you actually have a huge addressable market of people who've got great products, great experience. Uh, they're not going to get it from the classical sort of VC community. And that's, you know, I don't particularly blame them. They've got their own drivers. of how. Yeah, yeah, no, it's not a blaming. It's just a fact. It's, it's a reality. And so when you see yeah. come to those different communities and say, if you've got, a really smart idea. And this first fund, I didn't mean to interrupt, this first fund you've got that's picking up $10 million with the goal of being the first supporting capital to what will become basically IPOs on ROICX. That's genius. I mean, you, you've got a huge addressable market with that. Yeah, I, I think so. And the um, uh, people of, you know, this is an old formula in, in terms of, uh, how, if you look at how Poland, after going through all of that disaster in, 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 in the Cold War, were able to turn their economy around, they did it through an exchange and through having a wall of cash and having entrepreneurs, innovative groups come in. So we are, I believe video gaming is one of the primary things. Poland has managed to increase their... Um, um, standard of living through an exchange and an exchange is one of the banks no longer are the growth engine of the economy it is an exchange in some format that is the growth engine that's why i really love exchanges yeah. no, it, is, it is it is in many ways the ultimate created the way they are now the way we have all this dispersed ability to speak across long distances it's the ultimate democratization of capital allocation, right? I can choose to invest in this cool company that is accessible, as you say, on my Arawak X app on my phone. And yes. if, you know, everyone sees that and says, wow, if I put 50 bucks into this, it's better than going into a savings account that's paying me negative real interest at the moment. Uh, yes. <laughs> so what, what do you think are the, 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 the big next steps that, um, you know, push you from, where you are now with some early successes, some lessons learned, right? Like, for example, that FDA thing. Surely those those women are going to come back around and looking for funding elsewhere. But there must be lots of different companies like that, yeah. that once you get momentum, 
you're trying to build on that liquidity. Right. I, I, I think it is having the predictable selling system. Yeah. So once we have that wall of cash and, and uh, our attack now is to go after um, and, and spread our message to as many funds as possible, to as many uh, family offices as possible, I come and take a look at what's in here. And once they see the quality of what's in there, and you can start re regularly churning these companies out with a good market. We all we also intend to um, pursue. Uh, um, no, I wouldn't say joint, but similar. We're going to set up a CF company in the United States of America as well, because the American we can tackle right now the um, accredited investor, but we also want to be able to attack tackle the uh, mom and pop investor sure the, the non-accredited investor but within the everything within rules and regulation making sure that everything is done properly so there would be an arawak ex um um united states of america uh we expect to be coming online within the next six months oh great um yeah because americans sometimes are comfortable investing with americans and you have to meet people where they are and in terms of moving from accredited to retail, is that, is that just an um, issue with the SEC about what they want to see in terms of who's allowed to trade? I and mean, what, what's been the gating issue thus far? Well, well, it's, it's, it is regulations. It's not technology. Um, and, and rightfully so, because people want to ensure that the um, small investor is protected. And we have that same interest. Right. But for me, the democratization of finance is beyond just access. It's also um, into being able to go internationally. As you stated, there are a lot of, of, of great companies that are in these regions or, or, or can be located in these regions that people will never see. And it's a marketing problem. Then it becomes a, a marketing problem. Sure. So people have choice. It's fine to, if your appetite is to buy into Apple or Facebook or something, um, that's good, but the whole idea behind crowdfunding is that you can get early access to Facebook, you know, the, right. to the to the next Facebook. Yeah. yeah, you know, I mean, getting it now while it's while it's on Nasdaq or New York Stock Exchange, that's that's good. But boy, if you could have gotten that when it just first came out of the gate, yeah, it's, it's true. I, I've having been, you know, raised capital for years for many different things. Um, I find it. I find human behavior both predictable, completely illogical. I mean, the, the, the very fact that, that that economics posits this rational man, a rational person, is like one of the funniest yeah, yeah. jokes I've ever heard. Um, I, I consistently have seen it across industries, across uh, uh, you know many types of investments. That in my my opinion, especially supposed sophisticated investors, everybody wants to experience Google seed round returns with rolling 30 day T bill risk, and, <laughs> yeah. and all of them, and, the, and the, all of them. And it's just, and whenever someone brings stuff up like that to me, I say, great, why don't we list all the things we'd love to happen that aren't going to happen? And then we can <laughs> get to reality. Yeah. Uh, so I love that what you're doing is bringing that ability to say, you know, you get to participate in this. Capitalism is an inherently creative and risky business, but the risk is what drives the reward. So if yes. you as an investor spread a thousand dollars over ten companies, yes, that's the key. Three of them will do really well. Two will right. survive. Five will fail. But right. on the end, you'll do okay. And that's yeah. The and and the and the better vetted they are, the more this is where this is the difference. Where my twenty years in the wilderness as a as a <laughs> management consultant really comes in because we don't. We don't have listing criteria in the traditional sense that you just come in and then we judge you and say, no, we don't want you. Or we, we, what we do is we actually advise that, listen, you got to have a team. Okay, here's a business consultant that's independent of us. Go and speak to them about it. Um, or we try to help the firm get to where they need to be before they can list. We don't just turn them away because sure. people don't. People don't know. It's not that they're that they're um, they haven't had the the, the um, experience of going to UFC or, or Northwestern or I've been in that culture. 
Right. And when you're from the islands, for example, uh, island companies, and it's true in America too. It's true. Oh, totally. Yeah. Plenty of you, good entrepreneurs with great business sense don't deal with accountants and lawyers and regulations. Exactly. Existing requirements and all that. Just, it just doesn't come up. Yes, it doesn't come up. And so you don't know that, yeah, this guy likes your idea, but you're not you're not ready to for him to put any money in because he you don't even know where your money is going. Yeah. So uh, <laughs> and lot, and it's funny because a lot of people run successful businesses and their books are an absolute mess, right? You could run a perfectly successful bar or restaurant. Yeah, you know, good sense. I mean, you're not an idiot, right? You know what you're spending on vendors, and you know how much you know the bottle of whiskey is costing, and you're charging six bucks a shot. Like you get all that. Um, but when it comes down to putting that into a form that would fit into a, a regulatory filing for uh, a public yes. company, that yeah, people don't have that in their skill set. And when they're presented with it as a requirement, a lot of them just get discouraged to walk away. So your approach is brilliant. Like we'll help you get the boring but necessary stuff in place yes. so you can access growth capital and, and hit a much bigger market. That's awesome. Yeah, that's and that's our uh, ethos. And it actually makes work fun. Yep. Because you deal with a lot of different people and you deal with them in a healthy, positive way because you know you're trying to assist them. You're not just uh, you're not just trying to make money. Right. So well, making money is good, but, you know, of course, it has to be tampered with um, your, your overall ecosystem and cultural environment. Yeah. What are you making it for? I mean, that's, it's, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it's funny. I mean, I don't know if... It, it, I often think a lot of people have said when they look at successful companies, it drives me crazy. They say things like, well, they can afford to you know, act ethically or they can afford to do X, Y, and Z because it's successful. And it drives me nuts because quite the converse is true, right? They are successful because they're right. doing things the right way and they're attracting the right people. Um, you know, we're, one of the deals I'm working on a very difficult industry, but it's brilliant. But, it does, but are there easier things I could do with my life? Sure. Yes, not nearly as but you, you know, you know um, and it does come back, circling back to your original question of what's the difference between the European style, the English style, and the American style. There is sort of this um, idea that if you're doing business in, in, in England and Europe, that like you're kind of a little bit on the shady side. Oh, yeah, that's that concept <laughs> of coming back from the Middle Ages. Like the aristocrats don't sully their fingers with the <laughs> This is, yeah. I had that exact conversation with a friend who's, who's working on something fascinating in Europe. I'm not going to disclose more, um, but he's got a great board of really great people, right? But to an American, and they're looking for money, to an American, I look at that board and I'm like, ask each of them for a million bucks and we're funded. Oh, no, we couldn't do that. Yeah. Yeah. What do you mean you couldn't do that? They're rich as hell. Yeah. <laughs> they're, they're, they're sitting on this board. They want to see this thing succeed. But oh no, we, we couldn't ask them. Like, I'll be the rude American. Make me the horrible, tasteless guy. I'll ask them for the money. Yeah. <laughs> like, but they're kind of stuck in this weird place because they're not willing to pass the hat. Whereas yes. the, person, the first thing is, well, if you believe in it, that's fabulous. Right. I love your title, sir, whatever. But can you write a check? Right. <laughs> right. Or at least bring somebody to me to write a check. Exactly. Go find someone to write a check. Go get your banker and have him do the sully, you know, sully tacky stuff with the American. That's fine. <laughs> but that's that is fascinating. That very different view still holds of there's something sort of lesser. Um, yes. And that's that, you know, and, and, and without remotely giving him any credit whatsoever, but I mean that was. Hitler's greatest mistake when he referred to the English, you know, dismissively as a nation of shopkeepers. Keepers, right? <laughs> yeah. well, the nation, well, the, the nation of shopkeepers is the engine of capitalism that created the wealth, that created the empire that that killed you. So yes, uh, absolutely, and you can see the linkage, right? Yeah. But a lot of people can't see the linkage. No, but um, brilliant you are. So, uh, are you getting the first three percent of the nation signing up? That's absolutely brilliant. Like, is it? What are the biggest next hurdles here? Is it, is it all marketing or is it a mix of marketing and, and bringing well, I, 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 we, we are in a growth phase. And the biggest hurdle we have, quite frankly, is we need funding until we can get to that predictable selling market. These things, these relationships take time to build. Um, it, like I'm going up to Chicago this next week on a... Um, uh, a trip to just speak to people and to let them know what we're doing because now that the COVID's over, 
we've kind of gone into this uh, um, back. I want to see you. I don't want right. to this. And you lost uh, all this during this insane shutdown because remember, I live in Florida, so all of this passed us by because we didn't shut anything down. Forget the rest of the world went into stasis. So that's even more impressive that you got this thing running in the midst. Of yeah, the it it it. Um, I guess in some ways it was the best time to launch it hmm. because the ecosystems, the investor ecosystems, are broken, and hmm. they're just coming back together all of a sudden. Uh, New York City was empty. And yeah. so people had to find ways to uh, satisfy this investor ecosystem that's out there, this uh, this um, issuer ecosystem that's out there. And, uh, and what we saw was some people moved out of the city into, the, into different areas, even into different countries in some cases, as the technology allowed you to now start to to do this and to, to bring together these diverse ecosystems. And we just want to, as it resettles back, and it will, it will settle back. We want one of the centers to be the Bahamas. Oh, that's, that's brilliant. Well, I, yeah. I certainly get that. I mean, having moved from New York to America, I totally get that change. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I, I can think of far worse places to have a center than Nassau, quite frankly. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. That's awesome. Well, any final thoughts? I appreciate your time. I'm, I'm sensitive. You got other things to do with your day, but um, love having you on. Love, love what ROX is doing. Um, can't wait to continue to be a part of it. Uh, is there any other kind of final thoughts you'd leave? Yeah, just uh, just to say that um, uh, if anybody wants to contact me and uh, to uh, find out more about what we do or uh, interested in if they have issues in which they want to get funded, or if they want to uh, maybe look at some of these things in a front area, um, we're kind of becoming a content hub for, for the Caribbean and, and these, these, some of these startups that are doing business from them. And I, I'm open to calls and emails and, and what have you to be communicated. And I wanted to thank you for this opportunity to, to speak to your, your people and to speak with you and appreciate it very much. Awesome. Well, thanks. I will, I'll post the contact uh, page info in, in, in the description below. And uh, always welcome to have you on. Can't wait. I hope your Chicago trip goes well. And as we uh, end every Messy Times episode with reminding our listeners to save themselves the brain pain and turn off the mainstream media who are doing nothing but lying to you 24-7 and tune into Messy Times where we have nothing but enlightenment and brilliance. So thanks again for coming on. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. You take care.